So let's get to Scotty. <laughs> oh, Scotty. <clears throat> so I don't know if you guys went back. Um, Brian, I'm sure you did. I don't know if you guys went back and listened to the, the, the airing of the last podcast, but what I do is I always go in and I add buzzer sounds between topics and I add audio clips of things we've talked about. And I played the exact audio clip from that game. And I feel kind of bad for Pippen again because we know he did it and he got his own segment on this episode showing you know, how <laughs> royally he fucked up. But I think he kind of exposed himself again um, with an opportunity. And, and I think, yeah, I think, Ryan, you probably got it. Mm -hmm. But the play before that, because I watched it, I watched this thing on YouTube last mm -hmm. week before we even did our show. The play before that, they had a shot clock violation because Scotty didn't know what to do with the ball and basically threw up a bullshit shot and didn't get, didn't get mm -hmm. nowhere near it. And when um, Phil drew, drew up the play for Tony, Tony had already made three game-winning shots that season. Yeah. And it's a shot that Tony's made time and time and time again within the confines of that offense. Scotty Pippen refused to go in. Phil Jackson said, fine, you're sitting it out. So I played the, the press conference too. But the one thing I want to say, first off, before I get going uh, with the actual point of this, is do you, don't you guys feel bad for Patrick Ewing? Like he's always getting dunked on by Scotty or Michael. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I, I, feel, I feel the worst for him, man. I'm, I'm a Knicks fan. I, I lived through it. That we've been through a lot, but uh, I feel bad for Patrick. But I think when you look at games like that, it's – it was those guys' moments. I don't think it wasn't this Patrick. It, it, they would have did it to anybody, so I can't feel too bad. <laughs> I mean, when you're a, when you're a shot blocker, you're gonna get posterized as well. Yeah. yeah, you know. So the question is: So Scotty said he he wished it never would have happened, but then at the same time he said, "I do it again." Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that, Brian? It's a disappointment, honestly, because at that point in time, he was the leader of that team. Um, and to take yourself out of that game, like, I, I mean, Herm Edwards says it, right? You play to win the game. So what was he trying to do at that point in time? What, was he trying to prove a point? Was the point trying to be, well, I'm the man. I should get the ball. But, Jay, you brought it up. You know, Tony Kukoc had, you know, drilled three game winners already prior to that game. It, it, it's utter disappointment because I, I love Scottie Pippen. I, I have always loved watching him play. But, you know, you would, you would expect that at that point in time when he's asked to inbound the ball, that other than the guy taking the shot, that's the most important position on the floor at that point in time is the guy who's inbounding that basketball. Um, you take it back to uh, Christian Leitner's miracle shot. You know, uh, what's his name, um, Grant Hill, through that, you know, three-quarter oh, cool. pass, perfect. If it wasn't him, you know, then who else would have, you know, made such a great inbound pass? But maybe it just happened to be that, that this is how it was supposed to end up. Because I can't remember who inbounded it instead of Scotty this time around, but the play ended up working and Tony hit the game winner. But all in all, I was disappointed. Corey. Yeah, other Bush League, man, for him to do that. I mean, just end up pouting, you know, having that that mentality. Basketball ultimate team sport. And Coach drew up an excellent play for that situation. Had a player to execute the plan. Countless times he's done it before. As a leader of the team, you should understand that not every play is going to be designed for you to have the ball in your hand. You know, trust your teammate. You, you watch this guy in practice, you know, you trust the coach, you won a championship with the coach, trust that they're going to put the ball in the right place at the right time. So I, I just think it was Bush League for him to act like that. Yeah. Jay? And for me, for me, I think it's, it's, it was, like you said, it was Bush League and it was dumb because you just won a championship. You saw the best player in the world win the championship by passing packs in the ball to win game six against Phoenix. So why would you, why would you not trust that your coach is telling you to pass the ball, figure out a way to pass the ball? 
But I think it was his ego. I think he knew that he just messed up the play. And I think he wanted to be the one to fix it. But you just got to trust your coach and, and, and do the right play. I, uh, I misremembered because Jordan – passed the ball to Horace Grant, who turned around and kicked it out to Paxson. But, I mean, Jordan still passed the ball, but I, yeah. for years I'm saying that Jordan passed the ball to Paxson, but he didn't. He kicked it to Grant, and Grant swung it around. Um, I covered it last week. It's obviously one of the most disappointing plays and his worst effort. It doesn't, you know, I don't think it scars him in NBA history because everybody knows it already happened. But what's disappointing to me is hearing him, you know, retrospect. Well, I, you know, I wish it wouldn't have happened, but I would have done it again. <laughs> right. Like, okay. Well, you know, you've had all this time to think about it. You saw the impact it had on your team. Like they weren't, I don't know if they would have won anything, but they sure as hell weren't winning once that happened. Yeah. Because he was the leader of the team when Jordan was gone. They were saying they loved it. He would put his arm around you and talk you up. You know, he was the player's coach, right? He's the player's coach. You know, and then they get him. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So um, but yeah, I was disappointed in the fact that he he said he wouldn't do it again. And he he has yet to be on an interview though, since this whole thing has started. Which is mm-hmm. interesting. And a couple things. I'm sure you guys have noticed, you know, Horace Grant's been doing a lot of interviews and he's pretty pissed off right now. And then Craig Hodges came out of the woodworks to try to throw fire on Jordan after, you know, wow. last week and a couple of different things, which Pun in, no pun intended, because didn't Craig Hodges' wife set his ass on fire or something? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I think so, man. You Google that. I think I think oh, something man, like that happened. I think that. his wife tried to set him on fire. <laughs> so Tim Grover was getting and This is uh, the last real question before we, we wrap this up. So if you guys notice, so Tim Grover's been with him from the beginning, too, his trainer. Yeah. And you saw even Grover was getting a little emotional when he said that, you know, Jordan called him the day they lost Orlando Magic. And, you know, people are going to spend three hours of their day to watch me. I'm going to give them my full effort. They're going to get the best of me every time I play. Man. That was an inspiring thing for him to say. But my question is, was there a hidden message in there? Was that, was that a message to today's players? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. What are your thoughts? Jay, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think, I think everything Mike said, everything uh, uh, Tim Groover says and, and Mike, th- those guys, they always uh, stab in it and, and saying certain things. So I, it's definitely, they were speaking to the, uh, the uh, what's it called? Um, low management. He was speaking to the low management crowd, I think. Because <laughs> th- that would make it a passive aggressive statement. Um, yeah, yeah. But he did say it back then. But I don't know. That's what I thought about. And I was like, I wonder if they put that in the documentary to be a shot at today's players. Brian, what do you think? Um, I mean, it, it could be. Uh, I, I wasn't thinking about it at that point in time. Um, but I can see where you're coming from because it's it's kind of that, well, I've already gone through that life. I've I've had my career. And these are the things that I did to be successful. So, you know, when I look at, you know, some of these you know, cats that are coming up through the league now, I don't know that they're, you know, putting in the same intensity and the same work ethic that I'm putting in. Um, but then again, you got to think about it this way too. It's not every day that we see guys who work like Jordan or LeBron or like Kobe. You you watch uh, uh, that documentary Muse and you get a good picture of what Kobe Bryant did to come back from his ACL surgery. Um, so not everybody is, uh, uh, you know, made from that same cloth. I think that's really what he's trying to say, you know, at that point in time, if, you know, just trying to relate it to your statement is that maybe he is trying to uh, maybe encourage in a way, you know, the guys coming up, the younger cats coming up to, you know, just up their game off the court, you know, and just try to, you know, just try to do what it takes to be as great as everybody else was. Mr. Harrison. Well, some, like you said, they, they did air, but they did say that back in the day, but they did air it. Um, knowing that everyone is going to be watching, you know, they have the, the clips in there. So they, they air certain things, but we all know that those players were cut from a different cloth. Um, you know, I was looking at another, um, uh, I think another interview with Charles Oakley 
he said we play injured all the time. You know, it, it was just, he wasn't even talking about low management. I think it was uh, have y'all ever seen Coldest Balls with um Kevin Hart? They was in the tub. No, I haven't. Um, seen it. So they're um they're sitting in the tub, and he's basically you know saying how tough that that NBA that that version of the NBA was, where players would you know come out you know regardless of what they had going on, if they could walk, they would go out there and play, and. I feel like it probably was inserted into that documentary, knowing that this, today's players, you know, do just take off games if it was a meaningless game or anything like that. But they forget the fact that sometimes people are season ticket holders and want to see their favorite players out there and play and perform. And then you come in there and you see a player in a suit for for no reason, you know, taking low management. Like I've never heard. Like I, I grew up in the Kobe and Jordan era. I didn't. I've never known anything like that. It's disappointing to see that in today's game. I saw Michael play in 93, 92, 93, when I was a senior, you know, in high school. Um, one of our friends, and I don't remember who, dad got tickets. So we always had the seats right behind the basket, like those first or second row, you know, that they're always crashing into. But when I, we saw the Bulls, we actually had kind of center court up just below the top. So the camera's like right behind your head, which to me is my favorite view. But, you know, I saw Michael play and Scotty play. And, they, you know, they blew out the Dallas Mavericks. And Michael didn't play much in the second half, but he's, he, he balled out in the first half. And I got to see LeBron play out here, actually, when, before I moved out here, Brian. But I was disappointed because Dwayne Wade was a healthy scratch that night. Yeah. And he's my we second best player of all time. Sorry, what was yeah. that, Brian? No, I say we went to that game together, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I yeah, was just – to go along with that, like, I'm jealous, man, that you got to watch uh, Michael play. The other reason why I'm wearing this jersey, too, is because um, I watched one of the last games that the Bulls played in Seattle before. So I got to see Scotty play and, and that team, you know, with Tony Kukoc just coming on and all that stuff. But the one player that I never got to see live was MJ. So I'm jealous, man, that you got to see him play live. That's, that's a once in a lifetime for a lot of people. Hey, sitting behind the basket, you realize how small the basket is to those guys. That's yeah. like all of us playing on eight and a half foot goal or sometimes eight foot goal. Sean yeah. Kemp grabbed a rebound, and I don't think his toes were more than this high off the ground. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was like, the fuck, you know. So, guys, what was your favorite part of episode seven and eight? Jay. Jay, you're on mute, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Now, nah, my favorite part was uh, that B.J. Armstrong really thought that he, uh, <laughs> that he really – he really thought he phased Michael. That's that was that was funny to me. <laughs> Corey, the uh the Gary Payton thing. Um, he said he started laughing whenever he was talking about Gary Payton, um, shutting him down or or being able to phase him. And then he was looking at the the iPad or whatever he was looking at, and he was laughing. He was like, the glove was never a problem for me. I had some other stuff going on uh, during that time, but he was a factor. And I know Brian's probably gonna like this that part whenever <laughs> Gary Payton was switched on. You know, Gary Payton wasn't a problem. Everybody knows that. Like, so I think he did phase him a bit because his numbers did dip. Even if you go back to the seasons when um Payton would switch on Jordan, he he was a factor. He was a pest to everybody. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the glove obviously affected him. Um you know, that's pride. That's NBA trash talk. And, you know, Gary Payton and Michael Jordan are probably two of the top four trash talkers in NBA history. That's, that's nothing but respect. But I, was, I did feel a little weird when he was cracking up about that. I was like, oh, man, you know, that's another, that's another legend you're laughing at right in his face. But, you know, Brian, what are your thoughts on that? Um, because we yeah. did get to see your Sonics. So I'm sorry we didn't cover yeah. that. And then what was your favorite yeah. part of this? Yeah, that was my favorite part. Uh, even though it was like seven minutes long or whatever it was. Um, it's kind of how Corey felt about seeing Kobe at the beginning of that uh, one episode. Um, you know, just seeing the Sonics again um, and seeing some names on the back of jerseys that I had forgotten about. Um, it was it was great to see, um, and it just it just brought back memories of being a 15 year old kid, um, and then just knowing that oh man, like oh, we made it to the finals finally, but we're gonna get our ass kicked by the Bulls. But it's, at least it's the Bulls, you know. And, and it was just just a bunch of memories just rushing back from, from my teenage years. Um, but, you know, it, I do think that when they switched, uh, you know, GP to, um, to guard Jordan, I think it did make a difference, you know, and, and I don't, 
I, I'm not surprised by MJ, you know, laughing into, you know, the iPad when he was watching that footage of, uh, of GP's interview. Um, you know, you can't expect anything less, you know, from MJ. Um, but like you pointed out, you know, both guys are, you know, two of the top trash talkers to ever do it in the league. Um, but I, I do believe that he, he created a, a defensive presence that wasn't there the first three games for sure. Um, and you think about it too a lot. There's not a lot of players um, who, who play the point guard position any longer that can both play on the offensive end and defend the post-up game. And, and I, I will put it out there and I will say that Gary Payton is the best post-up point guard to ever play this damn game. And yes, I'm biased. I forgot he was such a, a post player. I completely forgot yeah. about that. Like Gary Payton was fantastic. Yep. He should have won one for the Lakers. Yeah. Uh, and that yeah. <laughs> not to scope creep, but that was the biggest upset in NBA finals history that I've ever mm-hmm. seen. I could not figure out for the life of me how the hell that happened. I figured Lakers in a sweep, Lakers in five. Right. I don't know what happened, man. That was that was just the craziest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Um I don't know if this was my favorite thing, but because I had a lot of things I liked about these episodes, but I thought it was cool, kind of what, what Jay what Jay was saying in a sense that, you know, BJ Armstrong got his shine, you know, because he's been a big part of this whole thing. And then they gave him, you know, they gave him his 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 game, you know, and like I think he was on there, you know, they're talking about for five, six, seven minutes. You know, so I thought that was kind of cool that, you know, BJ got his shine. What do you guys want to see in the next two episodes? We're we're winding down. We got one week left. Um I don't know if I said this earlier on a call earlier, but so I was watching Jasmine Marcus and um, and Jeffrey interview earlier this week, and the interview was taken, I think, just before our episode, like the second, just after the second week, and at that point, this was the first time they were seeing it too, so they're learning stuff about their dad that they never knew, um, and at that time they were still editing episode ten. So I don't know who's at this point who's even seen it all. I know that Jackie McMullen and all of them were saying they've seen up to nine. I don't know if anyone's seen ten. So I'm I'm thinking ten will be just maybe crazy. But what are you guys expecting other than what they showed us? And I think everything they showed us is probably nine. Brian, what are you expecting in the next two? Um, I think they're gonna cover the flu game. Uh so it'd be pretty cool to see a little bit more insight into that. Did Michael really have the flu? Um and then uh, one other thing I do want to see them talk about, and I hope I hope Brian Russell is interviewed. Was it a push off on that final shot? I don't personally think so. I thought it was a good crossover. He just, you know, just like he just had his left hand on him, and he just, you know, just kind of moved him away. But I don't think that it was an offensive foul because a lot of people will argue the fact that it was a push off. But I hope they talk about that for a minute, and I hope Brian Russell gets on and talks about it too. You know, there's a, one angle shows it's a push and one angle shows it's just like you said. You know, the physics support that it wasn't a push and the way Brian's, you know, his, his body momentum, it's just like, you know, going back to the shot against Craig Elo. Right. Craig Elo flailed out of the screen. He couldn't stop. And that's why we say Ron Harper couldn't have stopped either. Even if Ron Harper was on him, he would have just shot by. But, yeah, that's interesting. That, that would be funny because, you know, there were teammates on the Wizards after that. Yeah. Corey, what do you want to see? Same um, flu game. I want to see exactly was this actually the flu? I, I, I contested it so many times, you know, with the with the the severity of it. Like, I I just wanted to know, like, what did he really have the flu? Because now I'm really starting to think, you know, after watching all these other episodes, how he used things to fuel his um, desire to play or play with an edge or something like that, and so I just want to know, did he 100% have the flu? Was he getting over it? Because, you know, he I think he had like 38, 40-some points that game, right? Yeah, he, he balled out. I mean, what the – everybody on here has had the flu before. Like, that was that was some superhuman stuff. If you if you actually had the flu, he's passing out on Scotty Pippen, and you know it just it just seemed like a lot of theatrics in there. I mean, I really want to know did this man actually have the flu? Like, finally tell us that you had the flu. It, at least it wasn't a wheelchair like Paul Pierce's ass, right? Oh, uh. man. <laughs> <laughs> They're saying Paul Pierce actually had to take a shit or something. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, I heard that too. I heard that. Yeah, I heard that. Um, I, 
my thoughts on the flu game before we even see it, because you're probably right, we're probably going to see it. I think he may, he may have had the flu, and by the time the game came, he probably had flu-like symptoms. I doubt he was running a temperature. Maybe he was running 99.5 instead of 98.6, because you're right. I mean, that's a lot. And championship level, 38 points or whatever it was, you know, I mean, who knows? Um, I don't know what I want to see. They're going to talk about this guy who basically became a father figure to him, um, which I think is interesting psychologically in another way where he just he needs to have another male figure by his side who's a little older as a mentor. And I, I don't know where that comes from. You know, I mean, they said it comes from being around his father the whole time, but his father was tough love on him as a kid, as we saw. I think somewhere they're saying that, I mean, Jordan was like James was, was or um, Larry was like, you know, his, his father's favorite. And Michael was kind of more of the mama's boy. So I don't know if once he gained his father's adoration and his father just never left his side, I don't know if he had that void to fill. I guess we're going to find out. But I've said before on episode 10, I want to see all the Bulls. I want to see that championship team all sitting around, you know, kind of laughing and cutting it up. And I think the fallout from this is, you know, I'm curious to see how many people are going to come out of the woodworks and, and contest stuff that they've seen and they've heard during this Last Dance docuseries. Because like I said earlier, I know Horace Grant isn't happy. We haven't heard from Scotty Pippen. You know, we've heard from Tony Kukoc and, and other players from the first three-peat. So they have Judd Bushler from the second time. They have Steve Kerr, obviously, which he's – Steve Kerr has been excellent throughout this. But remember, he was a commentator before he was a coach too, so he knows what he's doing. You know, Bill Cartwright. We had a Bill Cartwright's, you know, sighting. And Horace Grant's been in a lot of them. And he's not happy. He's making his, 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 his runs, you know, on all these shows about the rumor of not getting food on the airplane, you know. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how, what, what happens, I guess. You guys got any parting shots before we roll off? Supposedly, I, I did hear that they cut off um, some, some audio from Horace Grant. And he basically was saying, Michael don't want to see me, didn't want to see me then, and he don't want to see me now. I've heard that too. Well, it's, it's, what's the show? The the undisputed. Undisputed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Skip, skip, skip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Have a good one. All right. Thanks for playing. All right.